So, um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, thanks for all coming back. So, sadly, we are now coming up to the end of the conference. Uh, and with this, our final panel, summing up uh, the core theme of this, which is how do we reunify and pull together the European freedom movement? Uh, in order to discuss this, we have a very distinguished panel, all of whom have worked in some capacity to pull together the European conservative movement. Uh, to my left, but by no means politically, is Mario Fantini, <laughs> who is the uh, editor-in-chief of the European Conservative, a quarterly journal and a fantastic publication which you can find copies of outside. Uh, Barbara Kolm is the uh, vice president of the Austrian Central Bank, but more importantly, she's the founder of the Free Market Roadshow, an academic and entrepreneurial tour that goes around Europe promoting freedom. Uh, Hannes Gazerison is a professor of politics at the University of Iceland and the author of 25 Conservative Liberal Thinkers, uh, a great book that's been published through New Direction and is available online on our website. And finally, Jan Sarachuk is the Senior Director for Transatlantic Strategy at the International Republican Institute in Washington, which is the uh, foreign arm of the Republican Party and offers a huge amount of support to center-right think tanks here in Europe. So, uh, it, I'm going to take a sort of liberty here and um, open with a preposition for you, which is that in organizing this conference, I've had a lot of time to reflect on the core theme of it. And one of my core reflections has been this, that conservatism today is as divided as it has ever been, even more so than before we took power again in the 70s and 80s. Uh, if we were to borrow an example from ancient history, I would say that we were looking at conservatism in the same way we would be looking at the collapse of Alexander the Great's empire. That where the empire of Reagan and Thatcher once existed, hundreds of splintering successor kingdoms now exist, all trying to claim the same legacy. So the question is, how do we pull them back together? I'm gonna to throw that question to Barbara Colm first. Well, thank you. Um, because I think we have lost the, de the definition of reason. Reason is center, center right, and this is what I think we all believe in. Our common denominator uh, is freedom, is exactly the headline that you chose for this conference. And there are, of course, various uh, ways and means to achieve that goal. And um, unfortunately, uh, the pro-market libertarian conservative groups have preferred to quarrel or to dispute among each other rather than uniting each other. Whereas the left has completely understood very well that we all, the conservative from the ultra-conservative to the pro-market conservative are their enemy and we have not united they have and that's i think our biggest problem and um, with this conference and what we have done in europe i think and what is happening in the us in many places we at least try to overcome that gap and it is a challenge for everybody it's not easy and we have seen disputes yesterday uh, over some remarks by our friends but um, I think if we look at what unites us, that's much bigger than uh, what um, kind of puts us apart. Well, Jan Sarachuk, I saw a lot of heavy head nodding there in agreement. So uh, perhaps you could elaborate further, bringing in perhaps the American experience of sure. pulling the right back together. Sure. Um, first of all, I always agree with Barbara, so you know it shouldn't be a surprise. Um, second, thanks, Robert, um, and New Direction for the invitation to be able to be here in Lisbon. Lisbon is, as you all now know, one of the most beautiful cities uh, in Europe, so thank you. Um, third, I do have to make just a tiny correction in your introduction. Uh, IRI is not the foreign arm of uh, the Republican Party. Um, we have no governance relationship to the party or financial relationship to the party. Although the chairman of our board is Senator Dan Sullivan from Alaska, who was selected uh, to take that job uh, by our former president, uh, John McCain, uh, when it was clear that he was no longer going to be able to, to play that role. Um, listen, maybe just a little bit of historical perspective I think might be helpful to us here as we try to be a little bit optimistic going out of the, the conference. Um, you know, back at IRI in Washington, um, I think we now have something like 400 staff. Um, and 
398 of them are younger than I am, right? Um, they have all, they're all millennial. They have come up in a different generation for them. Reagan and Thatcher is ancient history, right? They just, they have no, they do not share our memory um, of the way this worked in the 70s and 80s. And um, I think, in my opinion, they demonstrate a disturbing tendency to believe that the era that they live in is the only one that has ever mattered or will ever matter, right? And so they lose perspective on where things were before and where we've come from. So, you know, I was a high school student in the late 1970s uh, in a small town in Pennsylvania under the Carter administration, right? And let me just tell you, it was a perfectly screamingly awful time to grow up in the United States, right? Um, you could turn 16 and get a driver's license, but there was no gas to put in your car, right? You looked at a college career um, and knew that um, the inflation rate was going to eat up whatever salary you were going to be able to earn. And then the interest rates, on top of that, uh, were going to make it impossible for you to ever buy property and, you know, carry out your idea of what a family should look like, right? And <clears throat> into that environment stepped Ronald Reagan. Now, I think we delude ourselves when we continue to look for the savior to come from outside, right, and believe that somehow or another, mystically, that person's going to appear, because the truth was, of course, that Ronald Reagan had worked for two decades um, to be able to get to that point. But, you know, it was within a, a four-year period um, that essentially the world changed, because Ronald Reagan appeared in the United States and Mar Margaret Thatcher had already appeared in the UK. And all of a sudden, the relationship with the world looked different. And we, I think, very, very often, and I heard this here yesterday, and just to be a little bit self-critical, we spend so much time explaining how bad things are in the world and what we're fighting, and not enough time telling each other, you know what? It's actually going to be all right. We've got the better ideas. We see that day after day after day in our countries with regard to supporting families, um, enabling people to get into the job market and make successes of themselves. So, you know, I think that is something that we share across the Atlantic. We shouldn't lose sight of that. Um, and in the end, together, Europe and the United States, if we, in the conservative movement, if we look at the world that way, we can actually accomplish our vision of what we had back um, in the Reagan and Thatcher era. Let me just add, and there are many success stories that we should probably uh, discuss on, on this panel as well. Well, I was going to pass on to Hannes about this, because perhaps you can explain some of the more ideological backing of some of those success stories, how it is that liberals and conservatives can, can pull a, uh, a movement together and succeed in pushing back the left? Well, I think <coughs> the paradox is uh, that uh, we are in a country because we won the debate, not because we lost it. Why has the left been winning? The left has been winning because uh, we won the Cold War and it used to unite us against uh, the hard left. And once uh, the Cold War was uh, uh, won, we lost one of our strongest issues. Uh, secondly, uh, capitalism defeated socialism. Socialism lay in ruins, ruins uh, on the 25th of December 1991, when uh, the Soviet Union ceased to exist. So capitalism is now the only game in town. So uh, our very strong arguments against uh, the public uh, ownership of, not, uh, of me the means of production and uh, against uh, central capitalism became somewhat irrelevant. Uh, we were deprived of our strongest issues. Then there were uh, two social uh, but structural reasons uh, for, for, for the left winning. One of them is, and it's often overlooked, that more and more people are now working for or financially dependent on government, on government handouts and on government jobs. And this is somewhat extraordinary because if you look at the welfare state, it was originally uh, intended to help those who couldn't help themselves. But with economic progress, uh, the, the number of people who can help themselves has greatly increased. So the welfare state is actually much less necessary now than it was 100 years ago. Nevertheless, it has grown out of proportion. Uh, uh, so many people are dependent on, 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 on uh, government for all their livelihood. Then, fourthly, the left have implemented 
what Antonio Gramsci uh, uh, presented in the 1920s, they have established an intellectual hegemony of the left. They've taken over the media and the universities, and this has been a slow revolution from inside that we didn't realize. The barbarians are not outside the gate, they are inside the gate. And uh, since, paradoxically, leftists are much more leftists than rightists are rightists, uh, they hold their opinions much more intensely. Uh, you have much less toleration of other points of views at the universities, and I know this because I am a, I'm a professor at the university, and uh, there are certain ideas, and you have all followed the news about it, uh, woke uh, and uh, council, uh, well, I wouldn't call it culture, it's clamor. Uh, th th they are prevalent at universities. So, and <clears throat> I once told a friend of mine who was editor at a, 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 a right-wing journal a newspaper in Iceland, you can't hire people by merit. If you do that, eight out of ten will be left-wingers. Because more or less, uh, the left and the right, they are... They, they are a similar ability. Uh, abilities are distributed more or less equally between the left and the right, I think, intellectual uh, qualities. But the left wants to go to uh, the media and the universities, so eight out of ten applicants at this newspaper, they were uh, left-wingers. So you can't really be impartial and neutral and do things according to merit if you want to maintain the defense of the free society. You always have to be... Uh, on your guard for it. Well, I've been speaking uh, too long, but I perhaps might say one or two words about what we can do about this. Because uh, if we analyze this correctly, uh, then uh, what, we can, uh, what we can discuss is, first, the Cold War. I believe that uh, actually there has been a Cold War with China, declared by China, not by us. I, I would have loved to have trade with China and integrate China into world capitalism. But they are moving away from it. And they started this Cold War in 2012. And not because of Xi Jinping, but simply because the elite in the Communist Party has decided that the West is weak and that they have to strengthen their hold on uh, the Ch their Chinese subjects by uh, declaring this uh, Cold War. So I, I believe that we will soon unite against the Chinese threat. Uh, secondly, even if capitalism has won and everybody recognizes that capitalism is the only game in town, uh, the left is now imposing all kinds of extremely expensive uh, programs on us and uh, they, will, uh, uh, they will haunt them. They, they, are, they don't have the money for them. Uh, there will be all kinds of problems. Uh, so I think capitalism will be re de rediscovered as a result of the... Uh, uh, victory of the left in the last uh, few years. Then, uh, finally, uh, about uh, the structural changes, I think that uh, we have to privatize, we have to transfer more jobs uh, from the public to the private sector, and we have to uh, implement the welfare reforms to uh, uh, decrease the number of people who are financially dependent on the state. And then, the left uh, says uh, defend uh, the police, I say defend academia. Uh, what we have to do is, is, is uh, not to help uh, uh, our suicide uh, and uh, subsidize people who are our enemies. So these are the four things I would do about the uh, victory uh, of, of the left. Well, there's quite a lot to unpack there, and I think that Mario Fantini is perhaps best placed to look at some of these uh, institutional issues. Well, I'm not sure about that. I'm, I'm not even sure there's anything left for me to say. I'll just say yes, yes, and yes. That was all good. No, let's get back. Your, your question was really about how to bring together a, a movement, a broad movement that's been fragmented. Um, and let me first say that I think this is a very exciting time we're living uh, in right now. Uh, I think these uh, fragmentations, these fissures, uh, these tectonic shifts on the on the center right are fantastic, because I think for too long we've been saying the same thing over and over again. It's become become kind of a dogma. It's actually become quite the very definition of an ideology that you keep saying the same formulaic things, regardless of how much the the, the circumstances of the world have, has changed. 
Um, and, and so I think what's going on now is fascinating and exciting, as I've said. Uh, yes, there's the emergence of anti-market conservatives. You have the journal American Affairs that's talking about industrial policy. I never thought I'd hear that again, right? Um, but it's all exciting because it's forcing all of us, uh, center-right people, to rethink the things that we took for granted, the, the things that we've been so facilely uh, been promoting or selling to others. Um, I think in the next 5, 10, 15, perhaps 20 years, it will coalesce. I think we are moving towards something, and um, it, it, we have to be just a little patient, I believe. Um, and, and to answer the question more directly, you said, how to unify it? Let me start with one quick quotation. It's going to sound like I'm promoting or uh, Matthias Carlson. I'm not on his payroll. I'm not a member of his staff, but he's just a very wise man. He, uh, he, he said this uh, last year in an article, the only way forward for the European right is through coalitions, innovative thinking, and unity. So the question is, how do we achieve those coalitions? How do we achieve that, that unity? Well, I'll, I can only speak, obviously, from my own experience with the European conservative. Uh, what we're doing is reaching out to create uh, friendships, alliances, and partnerships with new organizations and old organizations, with think tanks, with publications online, uh, new media and old media. We're trying to have events to bring together different people on the center right around Europe and perhaps across the Atlantic. We're even go going to reach into uh, Tokyo, hopefully. There's a, there's a few conservatives there, um, non-nationalistic types, believe it or not. Um, and, and so I think this is one way that we can uh, bring some kind of unity to the global right, an expression that many people don't like, but I'm increasingly using it. Well, on the topic of events that manage to pull together both sides of the family, classical liberals and conservatives, I think Barbara Colm perhaps could give us the experience of the Free Market Roadshow, in which she has successfully pulled all elements of the centre-right towards a common goal. Well, yeah, you're right. Thank you. Um, by now, we have more than 120 institutions. There's think tanks, universities, um, clubs, business clubs, management clubs, student clubs uh, in over 40 countries in Europe that we work with every year for one tour. I mean, unfortunately, due to COVID, la the last two years were, well, actually not really all of them, but many of them were, uh, were online. But we started this year in August with the first live events um, in Zurich, and London was a huge event uh, last week. And we will have the next ones coming up um, live with uh, hundreds of people joining us and the students that we reach out to with different um, different formats sometimes we only work with uh, business groups where we invite of course the universities and the think tanks to bring their young people in um, but in some places we work with universities and we invite the business people to join and to mix and mingle. In some places, we even have job fairs afterwards. And you would not believe the outcome of it. It's uh, totally people who would never, ever look up our websites, whether it's a conservative or pro-market or libertarian or Hayek or Austrian or whatever it is. They would not look that up. But you know, when they know that they might get a job, that they might uh, meet an interesting entrepreneur or journalist who they have been following, then all of a sudden they show up. And sooner or later, you know, they are involved in our ideas. And we started the Roadshow in 2008, just export, having the idea of exporting the good old Austrian school and what uh, the first conservative freedom government in 201 uh, with Schüssel as, as, as a chancellor did, exporting pro-market reforms, replicating what Reagan and Thatcher did. And we thought, well, let's do that and start that in Europe. We had four cities at the very first year in 2008. Then came the so-called financial crisis, and all of a sudden, uh, we had to change topics. Uh, we, we changed topics, which we did, and we were very successful. We predicted uh, the European stability mechanism. We're, we're against it. We were discussing migration and immigration already in 2012 long before the crisis had hit Europe, but just to make people aware 
what is happening, and all kinds of things. And this is a success story, and I can only invite each and everybody of you here and of your teams and of, of the respective think tanks that we have not been working with yet. Uh, even, you know, there are two new groups in Rome. Well, wonderful, join, join our Roman and Italian friends next year. We need alliances everywhere, and the more, the merrier. And I think this is it, what, what makes the difference. We can have disputes and debates on the panels, but, and we, but we should be, as you mentioned, tolerant enough to accept the various minds, but always keep in mind our enemy, I would rather call it political competitor. I think that's a more appropriate way to put it. Um, once to take our resources, our taxpayers' money, and they want to abuse us, they want to destroy our values, namely private property rights that I already mentioned at the beginning yesterday, but, and, and uh, self-responsibility. So a roadshow, for example, and label it neutrally. This was our, our idea, because if I had labeled it the Hayek tour, then I think it would not have worked out. But now we just call it the roadshow, free market roadshow, providing libertarian solutions to today's problems. It's neutral. And even people from the left join us. We have journalists from the left as moderators. And all of a sudden, you know, say, hey, those guys are not as stupid. They sometimes make their point. And this is, uh, this is what slowly makes a difference. And now we're doing it for 15, year, no, 15 or more years. And across Europe, we've been to the US, we've been to Latin America, and we're expanding it. And um, the more you want to join us, the m please do. We're happy to coordinate and cooperate because the division of labor is, I think, the best achievement we can have. Thank you. Well, Jan, uh, coalition building like this is very much at the heart of what the IRI does. So perhaps you could tell us a bit more about that. Yeah, sure, thank you. No, actually, I was going to put an offer on the table, just very practically. Um, we, of course, are a political party institute, right? We, we work with political parties around the world, and frankly, we need help. And one of the things that I think we have found to be most beneficial in building coalitions um, among sister parties is taking representatives of those parties on the training and technical assistance programs that we do um, all around the world. Um, believe me, there's nothing to put conservatives and liberals together more than going and working, for example, on Cuba, right? Fear focuses the mind, um, and we have lots of opportunities. Um, you know, um, the folks from Desenso are here from, from Spain, um, incredibly great partners um, across Latin America, um, and many other, others in the room who have been on IRI training programs or election observation missions. You know, spending that time together, facing down the real, our real enemies, not our political competitors, but our real enemies, right? That's a great way to build camaraderie and to build you know, at least parts of a movement and a network. Right? Can I just j jump in for a moment? Uh, I'm thinking about enemies, you know, our enemies, and we've heard a lot about China in earlier panels, et cetera. But the one phrase uh, I haven't heard, or, or term I haven't heard, and it might be because I stepped out a few times, sorry, uh, is uh, the administrative state or the corporate and managerial elites. I don't think any, anyone's mentioned that, and I think that's very important. I think that's the, the greatest enemy we have both internally, domestically, and internationally, because there is a global deep state, because there are many deep states. And uh, I think that was one of the things that convinced me at the very last moment to vote for Trump, for example. Uh, don't hold that against me, but I realized that what he was doing was trying to, or he and his people were trying to do, uh, was create some kind of nationalist revolution and, and to, to, to push back against these managerial elites. And I think that is where conservatives, uh, traditionalist conservatives, and free market libertarian types can co uh, come together and really push back against this. And I, I hope we can talk more about that. Well, in fact, I'll uh, pass over to Hannes, perhaps, to discuss a bit more about uh the difference between right populism and left populism, and how actually on the right we can work more constructively than they can on the left. Yes, I, th I think actually people have uh, overlooked a crucial difference between uh, right-wing uh, populism and left-wing populism. Let me, however, first um, point out that all politicians have to some extent to be populists, even our uh, heroes, uh, Reagan and Thatcher. Uh, John O'Sullivan actually described yesterday 
uh, the practical bent of Thatcher, uh, whereas she was also, of course, a, a, an idealist. Now, what is the difference between right-wing uh, populism and left-wing populism? It is the choice of enemies. Uh, both are built upon uh, a construction of enemies, and the enemies of right-wing populism is immigrants from other countries that are alien and uh, do not want to integrate. The uh, enemies of, of left-wing populism are uh, the rich, the 1%, the famous uh, or now notorious uh, 1%. But there's a crucial difference between those two groups who are the enemies. One of them is a group that uh, belongs to our society and uh, to which we have a moral commitment because they are our fellow citizens, namely uh, the well-off people. We have uh, duties to them uh, because they are our citizens. Uh, we do not have the same duties. We have, of course, duties to everybody in the world uh, to behave decently and so on. We, but we really do not have a duty to let in people who refuse to uh, behave in the way that's considered proper in our societies. Now, the, the case for free trade is unassailable. But, uh, uh, and, uh, and we all uh, support, uh, at least classical liberals like I do, even if I consider myself to be a conservative liberal, we support open borders. But open for what? Of course for goods. Of course for hard-working uh, immigrants that want to integrate. The, the best thing that can happen to a society if such people come. But should we really allow people who are only coming to our societies in order to get welfare benefits or to impose upon us their religious fanatism to come in, or people who are gangsters who, have, um, who, who are more or less uh, the, uh, <coughs> sent out being the agents of, uh, of, of, of all kinds of gangsters? I say no. So I believe that the immigration has to uh, be restricted in some way and that the, the borders cannot be open uh, in, in some ways. But I would like to uh, quote also my intellectual mentor, Hayek. He actually, in his book, The Constitutional Liberty, he makes uh, this very strong argument for open borders, with which I totally uh, agree. But he, he says, we cannot allow so much immigration that it will create antipathy and conflict and tumult in society. We have to do it gradually, moderately, prudently. So, by all means, let us allow immigration, but let us uh, not let the immigration destroy whole societies or threaten our shared values uh, that we have inherited over the centuries, as we can see in the Netherlands and in Sweden. So, I believe that uh, the uh, writing parties, they have to uh, work together. And I noticed both in Denmark and in Norway, that the left wing tried uh, for a while to disenfranchise uh, the, the populist right, which meant that basically the left would have a much higher proportion of the votes that were counted and uh, were taken seriously in the formation of governments and so on. And we should not allow that to happen. We shouldn't disenfranchise, uh, say, 10 to 15 percent uh, uh, of, of the population. So this is basically my uh, take on uh, immigration and right, right wing populism. I saw the Barbara Collins. Yeah. Uh, just one one small point that I would like to make. We, as think tankers, as intellectuals, as uh, I consider myself an intellectual entrepreneur, but being also an entrepreneur, um, talking with entrepreneurs and friends who work in their private enterprises, those people are afraid because if they are not well-meaning namely, you know, allow open the borders and, you know, giving out hand welfare checks, then they will be uh, treated as kind of disgusting or disgusted. And this is the, our biggest problem, that we also uh, help them and support them. Uh, that, hey, guy, you are, not, you are not only brave, but you're right if you do the right thing and speak up. And I think this is also one of our tasks that we need to keep in mind that it's not among educating the next generation, but also making sure that the business people that 
I mean the self-employed, the enterprises, that those feel happy about what we do, and then they also step up because, and money was mentioned in the last session, raising money in Europe as a pro-market, libertarian, mean capitalist, I put it this as bluntly on the table, is an absolute no-go. Maybe in Britain it's a little bit easier because the Anglo-American system is, uh, has a different uh, background of giving, but in continental Europe, forget it. So that's something where we need to work on, and it's a challenge for all of us. Hannes, for 40 seconds, because I have a question for both Jan and Mario after. Yes, uh, I, I was just going to point out that uh, for reasons that I mentioned before, uh, writing intellectuals will always be a minority of universities. We should not give up the universities, but we should also have the alternative universities, which the think tanks are. And the business community should really try to support both the uh, embattled minority in the universities and the think tanks. Uh, it's absolutely necessary to outweigh the tendency of the left to take over those uh, fields of, of life. So we'll go to Mario Fantini for a response to that one, I think. Uh, well, the moment you said universities, I almost reached for my gun, but I don't have one. Because I think the universities, the mainstream universities, the prestigious universities that I love are corrupted. I, don't th I, I think we should opt out of all of them. I, I can't believe Robbie George is still at Princeton. Um, people say, oh, well, it's because he's forming a new generation of conservative students. Sure, maybe, another Ryan Anderson, another, another Sheriff Gergis. I think, well, let, me, let me rephrase that, think about how powerful a message it would send to, have, to see Robbie George, tenured from Prin Princeton, resigning uh, from there. I think more people need to start looking away from the prestigious universities and looking at alternative universities, maybe even creating their own. There are initiatives uh, on both sides of the Atlantic. Uh, I'm, I'm really increasingly thinking about, uh, across all spheres of, of human activity, opting out, pulling out of what's out there. This is not Rod Dreher's Benedict option. I, I'm not advocating that. I'm thinking of creating alternative structures. I'm thinking in a counter-revolutionary way. I'm thinking, well, you could almost say it's a Gramscian way, maybe. But I'm really thinking uh, in the way that the new left thought in the 1960s, because that's basically the situation we're, we're, we're in now. We are where the new left was in the 1960s, and we need to, I, don't, I hesitate to say this, but use some of their tactics. As, as an alumnus of the University of Buckingham, which was the first experiment in the UK in uh, free market education founded by Thatcher, I can fully sympathize with that view. But I, I want to take uh, things back to something that Hannes mentioned about the Danish and the Norwegian experience of bringing things back. I was wondering if Jan Sarczyk, you could give us um, some examples from Europe or perhaps from America where we've seen that sort of harmony on the right across the full spectrum. Uh, no, thanks. Let me, if, Mary, if I can just add one of the, another one of the reasons that universities are corrupted is because of Chinese money, for example, just to put that fact on the table, right? Which is also, I think, a big concern, at, at least in the United States. Um, Look, you know, there's been a lot of debate um, on among center-right political parties about what the best way forward is to to negotiate um, what we've seen over the last 10 to 20 years um, in the decline of traditional mainstream umbrella parties on the center-right. Um, I mean, I always come back to Austria when we talk about examples. In the immediate post-war elections, the big center-right grouping and the big center-left grouping walked away with something like 96% of the vote, I think it was. Um, and... Obviously, those days are gone in most of our political systems in the transatlantic space. Um, it seems to me that the real stars um, are uh, the leaders among, in center-right parties who have figured out um, how to address the right-wing populist uh, challenge um, and have done that most effectively, in my experience, by bringing those parties into coalition and bringing the voter base back. Um, and we've seen, we saw Erna Solberg, Solberg do that effectively, I think, in Norway. Um, we've seen Sebastian Kurz um, do it in Austria. Um, so there are a lot of ways to do this, and it can be done, and it can be successful, um, and it can restore uh, center-right parties to a, to a very competitive position that they had lost over the years. Um, um, it's not easy, um, obviously, and um, you know, I think um, it requires a lot of coalition building and investment, and I'll go back, if I can, I forget who quoted Matthias, um, but I think you know what the Sweden Demo Democrats have been doing up in Stockholm is is masterful. 
um, in um, finding a way to put that coalition back together again. Um, so there are lots of bright spots um, that can be used and that we at IRI use um, in other parts of the world to demonstrate how you, you know, get a center-right party's mojo back. Could I get Maria Fantini's view on that? Yes, did, you, did you see me shaking my head a little bit? I'm sorry. Uh, I, I see, I, I listen to this, this, this kind of uh, language and I think to myself, we're, we're still talking in a way that uh, applied maybe 20, 30, 40 years ago. Uh, the world has shifted so much that building coalitions and consensus seeking, I, I don't see that as effective. In fact, the mainstream parties, and I'm a lifelong Republican, so pardon me for saying this, but the mainstream parties like the GOP in the US, like the CDU in Germany, have failed. They've continually failed their base. And that's why you're, you're seeing these alternative, very nimble, very exciting parties across Europe. Uh, AFD, um, Vox, Chega here in Portugal, uh, Fratelli d'Italia and the Lega in its new uh, expression. Uh, and, and they offer promise. Uh, they're the ones who are really addressing what people have not been getting from the mainstream parties. And so I, I don't see that the future of, um, of the right, I, I don't even say center right anymore because I think it's the center right that's failed. Um, I, I think the future of the right lies with these smaller parties and in fact they're growing. Uh, there was, there's an alternative party in Sweden, I won't mention it, uh, it's very controversial, but a few years ago I think it was at 1% and last night I heard that it's uh, inching up to 8 or 9%. So this is exciting, and that's the future. We're going to see this continuing to develop and evolve in this direction in the next five to 20 years. I think Barbara Cohn wanted to respond. Uh, I'm glad you brought it up uh, that right after World War One, uh, two, sorry, uh, for example, the Austrian example, which was true over Western Europe, you had this big right block and the big block, the conservative block and the block on the left side, and they divided uh, the voters, and it was like almost 90%. And this, those those big blocks don't exist anymore, and it's just what you mentioned. And I think the parties that that we have known over the last, I mean, our generation has known, not the young generation here, but the not, unlike you, Robin, uh, the, those parties do not exist anymore because they are also as not like Hayek said, influence top down, but they are also bottom up and they are much more flexible and they are, you know, the, the, the conservatives, the center right probably would never have discussed uh, climate issues or smart sustainable cities or artificial intelligence or new technologies in a way uh, that we are now engaged in and I think this is a huge opportunity for us that the uh, sphere is so wide and it's not just only, you know, family and stick with that and with being conservative, but it, it's much more. It's all those resources that we need to create wealth and added value for everybody. And I think that's, uh, that's the biggest difference and we should take that as a huge opportunity for us. Perhaps Hannes would like to respond. Yes, <clears throat> I think it's crucial for uh, conservative liberals, uh, like I would uh, define myself to be, not to allow the left to have, uh, or the devil to have all the best tunes. And uh, therefore, for example, I don't think we should really adopt a hostile uh, position towards nationalism. There is good nationalism and there is bad nationalism. The bad nationalism is the militant aggressive nationalism that we saw in Europe in early 20th century. But the good nationalism, in my opinion, my humble opinion, is the nationalism of people who uh, recognize a collective identity, uh, like the Norwegians did in um, 1905 when they said, we are Norwegians, not Swedes, so we are going to separate from Sweden. Like the Icelanders did in 1918 when we uh, separated from the Danes. Not because we were hostile to the Danes, we were just simply not Danes. It was not a part of our identity. The same with the small Baltic uh, countries, the, the nations, they wanted to be themselves. They didn't identify with the Russians and neither did the, the Finns. And there is nothing wrong, in my opinion, with this kind of uh, nationalism and also with the pro protection and defense of certain symbolic uh, values of the nation, not only the flag, but also old manuscripts and uh, special uh, um, places and so on. So. Uh, we should really, in my opinion, channel nationalism uh, into uh, 
and um, enlist it uh, for, for, our, for our cause uh, because it is a powerful uh, emotion, but it has to be liberal, uh, it has to be national liberalism, like we had actually in many places in the 19th century when liberalism and nationalism uh, were united together. So uh, this is one uh, suggestion that I would make that might unite conservatives and liberals. We'll quickly go Barbara, then Jan. I would, quick, I would even go further. I would just simply call it the traditions. And it's the Judeo tradition values that made Europe up, our diversity that has made us big. And I think that's it. And, and nationalism has such a negative connotation, unfortunately. And if you call it traditional, I think it's even nicer. Or I would even go as far as to say it's the distinction of patriotism and nationalism, yeah. which is to say that patriotism is I love my country and I want to share it. Nationalism is I love my country, but I must protect it at all costs. Mm -hmm. Uh, Jan, very quickly. I'd like to go back to something that Mario said because uh, I just want to emphasize that I agree with it entirely. Listen, listen we're not in the, in the business of protecting traditional mainstream political parties, right? Political parties are organic, right? They grow, they develop, they change, sometimes they die, um, and that's okay, right? Um, so much of what we see, in my opinion, going on in the transatlantic space and to a certain extent across much of Latin America right now is, you know, a sort of... Uh, regeneration process in the political parties that we have come to know as or come to expect would always be there some of them will some of them if they adapt um, and respond to the sort of challenges by startup parties that are closer to the base and actually address issues that real people in real places care about right those parties if they address those issues they'll be able to defend themselves which is great right if they can't then they should die um, because they're no longer putting something on the political market that people want to buy and that's completely reasonable. The trick, I think, is how we collectively, um, and I, this is going to sound deep state to you, and I'm sorry for that, um, manage that process so that we don't um, engage in um, mutual destruction um, among the parties on the right of center, right? Competition is healthy, right? But we also don't need to constantly cut each other off at the knees, right? Because that's not healthy either. It's too bad we don't have a mechanism like uh, mutually assured destruction, right? right. <laughs> As time is running short, I'm going to go for one last question that for all of you to answer, which is, I, I, I will start with a sort of statement, which is this, which is that no one in this audience should be leaving here today without at least 50 new Twitter followers from everyone in this crowd, or at least 30 new business contacts to help strengthen the community. So my next question and my final question is this. How do we stay in touch? How do we share our ideas? And how do we strengthen the bonds of a unified conservative movement that we established today? We'll start with Mary. Uh, may I respond and then give the floor to someone who's eager to ask a question in the audience? Will you allow that? Maybe mm, we, kind of we controversial. Can have, we can have All right, we'll come back to it. Uh, how do we stay in touch? Uh, you, you mean uh, in, in the context of a big tech uh, and woke capital and and these, uh, these mechanisms that constantly suppress and censor us, well, we can uh, shift to alternative platforms like Getter, which is uh, being promoted right now in Europe. Um, we can go to Proton for email. I mean, is that the kind of simplistic answer you want, or is something more, more profound? Something more profound, perhaps, uh, you know, a publication. Ah, perhaps a publication. I, I wish I knew of one. <laughs> no, um, I, I, one of the reasons I brought so many European conservatives out there, and you see stacks of them, is because I'm hoping to inspire some of the, the younger members here, or even the older members of, of the audience, to, to start their own publications. I, I've met several great people here who already have online things. Uh, they can be online platforms, online only, or, or they can be uh, pamphlets. Uh, uh, new magazines. I think we need more such things. Um, one one thing that we're trying to do with the magazine, as I referred to earlier, is bring together disparate voices from across the the, the world. And 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 I'm finding that um, the biggest challenge in doing that is working th across linguistic traditions. So we've been hiring uh, a team of translators. There are so many people out there who are or could be the next Roger Scruton and they just need to be translated. They're completely ignored because they're not publishing and writing and working in English. So I, I hope some of you out there might have friends who, who might do this kind of work. There's people in Serbia writing in Cyrillic. There's people in Portugal who, who should be better known in the West, who should be better known in the uh, English-speaking world. 
Uh, I'm sure that among them there'll be Legupkos and O'Sullivans and Scrutons, as I said, and it, it's terribly uh, exciting because it's, it's almost like looking for an Easter egg. They're, they are out there. And so I'm hoping that the European conservative, would, conservative will not only be its own platform for this kind of work, but will, as I said, inspire others. Barbara. First of all, not be jealous of each other. If another think tank uh, is more successful in fundraising or whatever, you know, just it's good if those guys get more money. Well, then why don't you run after the next one? and you know just cooperate and divide the labor and i think there is the fields are as as big as i already mentioned from uh, climate to uh, taxes to social securities everything is there and just unite in and divide the labor let those guys do what they can do best and then let's sell it together in uh, it doesn't have to be one brand but we can brand it like this event together and also find to uh, find ways to combine the network and i'm totally open i'm i always share addresses i by the way i've learned this from bridget wagner from heritage uh, you know when when i was a young kid in the freedom movement uh, she introduced me to many people and i'm happy to do exactly the same thing all over and i think this is the thing that we need to do not to be jealous just to be open and to share because after all uh, in the end the more we are uh, the better we will get and the more our vo voices are heard and i'm really glad that new direction pulled this off and uh, I know all the work that the entire team had here. And I was talking with your director, Thomas, yesterday and congratulated him that uh, he trusted in his team that it would just do the wonderful job of bringing in all those people. And uh, I think this is a wonderful basis of collaboration for next year. And I'm sure that some of the people here in the room have their own ideas already or have their ideas. And I think if we match them, uh, we will get something out of it. And I think that's the future. Network, 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 and introduce everybody with each other who has the same mindset. Hannes. I think that <coughs> we have to make the young people aware of the enormously rich and deep and profound uh, civilization in which we have chosen to share uh, the civilization which originated in the West but is applicable or relevant to the rest of the world. Uh, a, a tradition of uh, private property, uh, free trade, uh, limited government and respect for traditions. I tried to do this in my book on the uh, 24 conservative liberal thinkers and uh, <coughs> this is a very rich and diverse, uh, diverse tradition. And uh, we have spoken here about political cooperation, but we also have to speak about the intellectual uh, war of ideas, uh, how we can demonstrate that socialism doesn't work, that the government is the problem, not the solution, and how capitalism really has the resources to solve all kinds of problems, not least environmental problems, uh, so that the only uh, remedy against uh, freedom is more freedom. And then uh, finally, I, I believe actually that our position is uh, philosophical or even metaphysical. The reason why we are conservative liberals, why we uh, support the Western civilization is that we simply identify as individuals who have gained over centuries, the ability and will to choose and to go out of the tribe and uh, cherish uh, our identity as individuals with choice. And finally, Jan. Uh, real simple, Robert. Um, take me up on my invitation, right? Join us. Let, let me know if you want to serve as a trainer teaching your experience um, on how to develop a political party someplace in the Middle East or North Africa. Um, if you have a, a specialization in election processes, let me know and we'll get you onto an election observation mission in Mongolia. Um, um, you know, you name it. There are lots of different applications. Um, how do you build a think tank? All sorts of things that, that we can do together, um, that, we can, that we can work on together and that we can all share with each other and at the same time understand 
that um, no matter what anybody says, um, I mean, I'm, I get paid to be a hopeless optimist, right? And no matter what anybody says, um, about the decline of uh, freedom and democracy around the world, all you have to do, all you have to do to realize that we are on the right side of history in this is to watch what people have done recently in Cuba, what people have done recently in Hong Kong, what people have done recently in Venezuela. You name the country, um, it always comes back to the same thing. People want what we're offering because they want freedom. Well, Jan, Hannes, Barbara, and, and Mario, thank you so much for that. And thank you to our audience as well.